So the next talk is round optimal multi-party computation with identifiable abort by Michele Ciampi, Divaravi, Luisa Siniscalchi, and Hendrik Wardner. And Michele is presenting. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, Manuela. Yeah, so multi-party competition. We are at fifth session, not going to say what that is. Uh, but there are many models uh, in which you can uh, study multi-party competition. Uh, in particular, the model we consider in this work uh, has dishonest majority. Uh, we assume no setup. We assume that parties are fully corrupted and they behave in a rushing way. It means that in each round, the adversarial parties will wait to receive the messages of the honest parties and then they will speak. Then uh, all our protocols will rely on uh, standard assumptions. In particular, um, our protocols are based on uh, trapped permutations and uh, we only deal with the black box simulation. So what we know is that uh, in the case of a dishonest majority, there are functionalities that cannot be realized. Uh, that's uh, um, a bad news. Uh, so we cannot realize fun some functionalities with fairness. Um, however, if we don't care about uh, fairness, uh, we know that we, we, I mean, we still need four rounds of communication to compute um, some meaningful functionality. And we know that four rounds are also sufficient. And uh, some recent works show that you can do that from num some number of theoretic assumptions or uh, from um, a malicious secure uh, notion of, uh, of ob obvious transfers. However, if you look at all these protocols, you will notice that they are secure uh, under a notion of security that uh, is called uh, security with the unanimous abort. So in, the, in this security notion, what you have is that uh, uh, honest parties uh, might abort or might get the output of the computation. But how, if they do abort, I um, mean, like it's not like one party will abort and the other no, like all the honest parties will agree that that's an abort. Uh, with unanimous, uh, with identifiable abort, instead, what you have is that in the case that honest parties uh, abort, they will also identify uh, one of the corrupted party. And the natural question is whether we can still construct a secure protocol in this setting um, in four round, which is, as I mentioned, uh, the optimal, the best you can do. And in this work, we answer to this question to, to the positive. And the way we tackle this question is by providing a compiler that takes an MPC protocol that is secure with unanimous abort and turns it into a protocol that is secure with uh, identifiable abort. And like one, um, and moreover, like the communication channel we, we use here is a, is a broadcast channel uh, where like in each round, all the parties speak at the same time, okay? And so focusing on the messages of this uh, purple party on, on the left, like uh, each message will go in this broadcast channel. So every party uh, will receive this message. So let's say that those are messages of an NPC protocol with unanimous abort. So one way that you can use to achieve um, identifiable abort would be to attach to each of these messages uh, non-interactive zero knowledge proof. Because in this way, every party that uh, receives a message that sees a message on the broadcast channel, even if this message is not directed to, to this party, uh, the party can still check that the message is correct because uh, if the, the zero knowledge proof uh, verifies. Here I'm lying a bit because like you need some special properties on the MPC protocol to apply this type of compilers because I mean, you need perfect correctness. Otherwise, of course, this doesn't work. Um, but the big problem is that uh, non-interactive zero knowledge requires setup. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we want to use, um, we don't want to use a random oracle. We don't, we want to rely on uh, standard assumptions. Uh, so uh, the trivial idea would be, okay, uh, let's use then uh, um, multi-round zero knowledge because we know that we can actually do zero knowledge in four rounds. And so if you now look at the protocol or, or at least at the messages that, uh, uh, one party sends and receive, uh, the view of this party is the following, right? There is an outgoing message and an ingoing message. And what you can do now is that for each outgoing message, you you ask this party to uh, provide the zero knowledge proof. 
which we know we can do in four rounds. And the theorem of this technology proof is, of course, that the MPC message, the outgoing MPC message is, uh, is well formed, I, that I've been following the protocol. And you do this for all the messages. Uh, this uh, um, um, works, but you need uh, that the zero knowledge protocol is uh, publicly verifiable in the sense that in this case, like you need to provide the knowledge, pr knowledge proof to convince any of the parties that are involved in the protocol. And now, of course, that might be an abort in the, in the zero knowledge. And you want that even the parties that are not involved in the generation of the transcript of the zero knowledge can identify whether the abort was triggered due to an incorrect behavior of the prover or due to an incorrect behavior of the uh, verifier. Okay, and these zero knowledge proofs are easy to, to, to achieve. So let's assume this is not a concern. Uh, what is a concern though, is that this protocol is far from being optimal. I mean, this is not, those are not four rounds. Good, so then the next step to solve this issue would be to say, let's just run one big zero knowledge where we prove that everything is, is fine. Um, of course, like if you want to do that, so if you want to run a zero knowledge proof in parallel of your MPC protocol and prove at the end that all your messages were computed correctly, you need the zero knowledge to be uh, delayed input in the statement because the, your statement, which is the set of messages you computed, will be fully determined only in the in the last round. So now, if you have this protocol, the way an execution of this protocol uh, would uh, be, it, it, it should look like something like this. So uh, this powerful party will compute the MPC messages and it, at the same time, will start generating this zero knowledge proof. And at some point it might be that uh, the MPC fails. Uh, and, but it, we don't know the reason why the MPC fails. Uh, however, the, this powerful party here will keep uh, generating the messages for the zero knowledge until the end, uh, proving that the messages that uh, uh, she has generated were mm, well formed. And now given that the zero knowledge proof is, uh, is publicly verifiable, the only reason why uh, this um, powerful party would not be able to complete the zero knowledge proof is because she was behaving maliciously. And so all the parties can identify uh, this specific uh, powerful party as the as being the corrupted party. So um, actually zero knowledge in this setting is not uh, really what you need. you need something stronger. You need a form of normalability on the zero knowledge. Uh, which is something that we uh, we show how to achieve uh, uh, in the paper, but what is more interesting and what I uh, wanted to talk in the in the last part of the talk is that so here we are running in parallel an MPC protocol and a zero knowledge uh, proof, but why would they compose? Like that there is no reason why they would compose in parallel, and and actually th they don't, or at least we don't know. Uh, yeah, to be precise, we don't know how to prove that they compose nicely in parallel. So the main reason uh, why uh, the proof fails is because, like, consider this, this is the real experiment where, like, you have just, I mean, it's the protocol I, I described to you, right? And when you want to prove the security of this protocol, ideally, you want to rely on the security of the zero knowledge and on the security of the MPC protocol in, in a distinct, um, in distinct steps. So what we usually do is that we do hybrid experiments, where in the first experiment, you run the zero knowledge simulator, of course, and then you prove that uh, this hybrid is indistinguishable from the real uh, experiment due to uh, well, the zero knowledge property of the protocol. And then you say, okay, good, now we run the MPC simulator and that's all, the proof is, uh, is done. Um, unfortunately, uh, we got an error. <clears throat> So unfortunately, the last step of the proof doesn't really work. And 
because what do you want to do in the last step of the, of the proof? You want to reduce the security of the protocol to the security of the MPC. And so it means that you are in this uh, game, like you want to say, now I'm able to construct an adversary that breaks the security of the MPC with unanimous abort. And the security game was, works in this way. You have a challenger and this challenger might generate messages for the MPC protocol in an honest way or in a simulated way. And we want to create a, we want to um, uh, show a distinguisher to reach a contradiction. And so the way we construct the distinguisher is by like uh, creating uh, um, an adversary that internally runs the adversary for, for, for our protocol, for the identifiable of our protocol, and just acts as a proxy between uh, like the Brutus channel and the, uh, and the challenger of MPC for the uh, black MPC messages, which are the messages of the unanimous abort protocol. So, okay, I mean, you can do that, fine. The problem is that we are in the play model. We don't have random oracle. So the way simulators usually work in this context is by um, resetting the adversary, by doing some what we call rewinds, right? So it means that the simulator of the zero knowledge protocol might say, okay, uh, here you are another second round, and I want to see um, a reply because I need to extract some secret for you uh, from you to perform the uh, the simulation. But remember, the adversary is rushing here, so the adversary, upon resuming the second round, he could change the second round of the MPC uh, as well. And now the adversary will never give you the third round of the zero knowledge unless he receives a new uh, MPC message with respect to the, to the third round. So he wants a reply that is consistent with this green MPC message. But the thing is that the challenger, you cannot rewind the challenger. I mean, that's not how this experiment is defined. And that's problematic. So we need, it looks like we need a stronger security notion. And what would be uh, suitable in this context would be a notion of, uh, of a multi-party computation that allows for uh, this type of rewinds. So the first thing we do is to define the security notion, and then we show how to, uh, to achieve it. In this security notion, basically you have your adversary and again the challenger, which does the same, either he uh, provides honestly generated messages or simulated messages. But now uh, the adversary can say, okay, uh, now give me a reply to this new uh, and fresh second round, which is this green message. And the MPC challenger interacts with the adversary and but stops at the third round. And now the adversary can actually do this process uh, many times, um, but he can do this only uh, a bounded number of time uh, of times where B uh, this bound is is known at uh, at the beginning, uh, and after this only one of those uh, sessions uh, will be com completed. Let's say, and like you can see that uh, if you have such an adversary, then like the previous reduction would work because uh, the rewinds made by the zero knowledge simulator would not. Uh, be a problem in the reduction because the empathy challenger is happy to give you more replies to multiple second rounds. Um, good. So now what it remains to show is uh, how you obtain uh, a protocol that is secure under this, uh, this uh, security definition. So consider for now just the two party case for simplicity. We have like this yellow party and the purple party. And uh, like they start uh, running an MPC protocol, a normal MPC protocol with no special properties at all. So what are what is the problem of uh, dealing with rewindable security uh, in general? So the problem is that if you just take any MPC protocol and you can see multiple third rounds as a reply to multiple second rounds, the problem is that this could uh, uh, break the security of the MPC protocol because you can you might be able to extract some some secrets. I mean, after all, that's also how a simulator would work. I mean, the simulator does rewind, so it's pretty clear that you are breaking something by doing the rewind. The a high level idea of our protocol is to not then send the third message of the multi-party competition protocol in the clear, but we will encrypt this message. And how do we encrypt this? So upon receiving the second round, 
uh, each party, and in this case, I will be focusing just on the on the on the orange party, uh, creates a garbage circuit. So the garbage circuit will contain the transcript generated so far, and the randomness of the uh, orange party. Um, and moreover, this garbage circuit is parameterized by a next message function. This is the next message function of, of the MPC protocol. So uh, with this garbage circuit, basically you can, uh, uh, upon receiving a third round message, uh, the garbage circuit can generate the third round on the behalf of the orange party and compute uh, the last round of the MPC protocol. So it's basically what I'm saying here is that the garbage circuit will do what, uh, um, what the orange party will do in the protocol. And uh, now what do I mean when I say that uh, the third message uh, of the protocol will be encrypted? I mean, we have a garbage circuit uh, and the party, the now the purple party in order to run it, it he needs to, to get the labels. And the way you get the labels is you by running an obvious transfer protocol where the, uh, where the, or the orange party will act as a sender uh, using as input the keys um, of this garbage circuit. And instead, the purple party will uh, act as a receiver. And his input will be a bit string that uh, represents uh, the third round message of the MPC protocol. So the security of a T now tells you that uh, this input, which is the third round message, is uh, kind of secure, right? The sender should have no clue about what is the input of a uh, receiver in uh, an oblivious transfer protocol. And that's basically how we make sure that uh, the third round is encrypted. But however, however, we want to encrypt, but we want to compute the output of this uh, MPC protocol. So what happens here is that then uh, the purple party will receive the labels uh, that are consistent with this uh, third round message. The, he will also receive this garbage circuit, uh, but now he has the labels, he has the, the garbage circuit, and he can compute the last uh, round of the protocol. And he can basically uh, now just run, just compute the output for the for this MPC protocol. Okay? And this is done um, in, a, in a symmetric way. Um, so the orange party will do exactly the same uh, to get the output. Um, now, of course, uh, it seems like we are saying, okay, now we, we need to run actually two primitives kind of in parallel. Now uh, we have this oblivious transfer, but uh, what happens if you rewind the oblivious transfer during the, during the reduction? Okay, that's okay because uh, we know from a previous result that uh, we, um, we know how to construct a windable secure uh, oblivious transfer protocol. So, uh, so that's, that's not a problem. Um, so, uh, I should say that to go from the two-party case to the multi-party case, it's uh, it's not straightforward. Like you, it, it is a two-party primitive, so as you can imagine, there are some problems when you go to the multi-party case. But the very high level that that's the very high level idea, more or less. Um, and so what we uh, also think is that this uh, uh, approach might be helpful uh, in any situation where you want, for example, uh, combine in parallel uh, in interactive, multiple interactive primitives. Uh, this means that you could prove secure also two MPC protocols that are running in parallel. And this might yield, for example, to uh, constructions like multi-party competition combiners that are run preserving and uh, like similar things. Um, and yeah, we show that this notion is actually uh, great when you want to achieve uh, multi-party competition with the uh, identifiable aborts. And what we show is that all our primitives can be based on Traptor permutations, but uh, yeah, we think it's, it's not hard to extend it and to realize everything from just uh, oblivious transfer. Um, yeah, but we can discuss this maybe uh, afterward. And that's all. Thank you very much. So thank you, Michele. Uh, we have time for questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the number of rewindings in zero knowledge would be expected polynomial time, right? So what yeah. do you said B to B? Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the point is that when you do the reduction, so our zero knowledge is uh, not any zero knowledge, it's a zero knowledge product 
protocol that we construct uh, that basically we prove that uh, if you get uh, let's let's say two accepting transcripts during the rewind uh, the simulation would work fine then what we argue is that in the proof you will get these two accepting transcript with some non-negligible probability and the reduction will go through so in the reduction we do not run in expected polynomial time but we cut the running time of the simulator such that uh, the reduction remains polynomial time yeah that's a reasonable yeah, question. And another thing is, did you also think about using non-black box zero knowledge? <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking about that actually this morning to use to try to use non-black box zero knowledge in the reduction, right? And then the final simulator would be still be could still be let's say black box, but uh, I mean, yeah, it, it depends. Like I would say, it's not that trivial because if you're still like I think, I think it would be easy if you if you if you just want the la the final simulator to be non black box, I think it's fine. But if you just want to use the power of a non black box simulator in the hybrid, and leverage on this, uh, I have no idea. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, so let's thank Michele again. Thank you.